What's up guys, it's Alex Trelli and welcome back to an episode of The Hand of the Day. I know you guys are liking it here out in Corona Del Mar, so I'm gonna shoot all my videos here this week. And this hand comes from one of my readers in Helsinki. He's played this hand at a like two, 125, 250 cash game. He's playing live poker in his casino out there. I love it, rep in Helsinki, so I'm gonna choose this hand for you. Really interesting hand. Uh, it gets limped around like five ways. And the cutoff now raises to $15, so it makes a huge raise. And at this point, like regardless of whether the you think the cutoff is stealing or the cutoff is only gonna do this with a strong range of hands, you have two kings, you're on the button, it looks like you're stealing. So you also have the cutoff who made it $15, he's likely to have a hand that could withstand a re-raise. So you wanna be very careful here about your raise sizing. You go ahead and make it $35 over a $15 bet, which relative to the pot, relative to his bet, is way too small. He could call with pretty much any hand here. And at the same time, you also have to ask yourself, man, like, what are you gonna do when you have a bluff? Like if you have eight, nine suited or ace, five suited or whatever, any hand you're bluffing with, you're never gonna make it 35. You're gonna try and win this pot right away and get your opponent to fold pre-flops. So you're gonna make it like 50 or 55. So I would love to see you do the same thing with two kings, maybe even make it 60 and look really bluffy and hope that your opponent has a hand. After all, he raised after five people limped. If he had a bad hand, he probably just would limp. So he probably has something and he could probably call a re-raise, maybe even four bet you or whatever. I would definitely be making it at least 50, but probably 55 or 60 here because that's what you're gonna be doing with bluffs and you wanna build this pot and charge your opponent to draw against your big hand. So that's a, like a decent sized mistake here. Um, even though it's like a small bet sizing thing, it sort of compounds. Um, it makes it tough for you to play post-flop because you just don't know where you're at. So this is a pre-flop tactic. Um, I have a cool pre-flop product out. If you guys want to know more about that, I'll talk to you about it at the end of this video. But for now, this is really what you need to know. You should be raising bigger here in spots like this where your hand looks like a bluff and you really want to protect your hand. So you make it 35, folds back around to your opponent. He calls, we go heads up to the flop. Flop comes queen, queen, seven with two spades. Pretty decent flop for us, but also at the same time, a little scary because of course our opponent could have a queen. He checks, we bet 50 into 82, which is fine. I think uh, it's a decent sized C bet. It's fine, you could even bet something like 40 here. It's a, it's a sort of a dry board. Um, give yourself a better price the times that you're bluffing. You could use a little bit smaller for bet sizing, but 50 is fine as well. He check calls and we go heads up to the turn. Turn comes an offsuit 10. Now the pot's building, right? Pot's about 180, and you sort of have an awkward stack size left. I mean, you have about uh, 900 left, so it's like, it's a tough spot if you bet and get check raised. And it's also a tough spot to get three streets of value, right? You have to ask yourself like, is there a worse hand that my opponent could call with three times? Maybe he could have something like pocket jacks. Pocket tens now has a set. Aces has you beat, which he probably doesn't have. Uh, but any queen has you beat as well. And if he has a worse hand than pocket tens, like nines or eights, he's probably not gonna call the flop and the turn and the river. So you really could only get two streets of value here and you wanna protect yourself from your opponent maybe bluffing you or check raising you and putting you in a really tough spot. So I would probably check behind the turn here, call a bet on the river or bet the river if my opponent checks. Otherwise I'm gonna bet the turn and sort of play the hand out and see what happens. Betting is also fine because a lot of times you're gonna be bluffing here, right? You're gonna have ace-king, you're gonna have king-jack, you're gonna have ace-jack, you're gonna have jack-nine, you're gonna to wanna to double barrel with eight-nine. So I'm fine with betting here as well, but you really have to sort of like keep it in perspective that it's unlikely you're gonna get three suits of value from a worse hand. So maybe checking the turn has some credence. Um, otherwise, if you're the type of player that's gonna double barrel a ton here, then maybe you wanna bet the turn to protect. So you gotta kinda know your own game, know your opponents, and know some of the deeper psychology, but those are the things to think about when considering whether or not to bet in very tough spots and complex spots like this one. You decide to bet 110. Now your opponent makes it 310, which is a really, really tough spot, because at this point it's like, you know, you only beat a bluff. He never has a worse hand for value, and it's hard for him to be bluffing. Like, he called the re he raised preflop after telling people limped, he called the three bet preflop, he check called the flop, and now he's check raising the turn. So it's like, would he really do this with a draw? 
maybe, I mean, you don't block any spades. Maybe he has like King Jack of Spades and this is like the one hand he's bluffing with. But if even if he's bluffing with a few hands, you lose to pocket sevens, any queen or pocket tens. And I think there's enough of those hands that beat you that you can just fold. So I think your opponent has enough strong hands that you can fold here without worrying too much about it. The other thing is like, you're gonna have a queen some of the time, you're gonna have a tens or sevens some of the time as well. So I think that you can just fold this hand even though it kind of sucks. Uh, but maybe you could call the turn and then reevaluate on the river. I would definitely call the turn, I would definitely consider calling the turn. And if I called the turn, I would fold to blank rivers or pretty much any river if my opponent bet again. I don't expect my opponent to go through on a bluff. And the times that I bet call the turn, I'm gonna have enough strong hands that I don't have to call the river with two kings. I'm gonna have queens or pocket tens or pocket sevens enough of the time that my opponent can't just go bluffing me to high heaven, right? So you decide to call a turn, which is fine. And we go heads up to the river. Now the river comes an offsuit deuce, complete blank, and your opponent jams all in for pretty much the size of the pot. So now you really have to ask yourself, like, is your opponent really going to run through a bluff again? After you call the turn, I think your opponent should change his game plan on the river. Maybe he was trying to win on the turn against the times that you're bluffing, or maybe he's trying to get you to make a big fold. But like, when you call the turn, uh, like, he's unlikely to bluff again because you could easily be snapping him off here with a queen or pocket tens or something like that. Wow. Check that out, it's cool. Uh, you could easily be snapping him off with like a huge hand here and it's just like kind of suicidal for him to bluff. And it, it's like you have to have a particular type of opponent to be bluffing here. So you really gotta know your opponent, you gotta know the situation. But I think without any information here, just in a random situation, I'm fine with how you played the hand so far, but here's where I'd deviate from you and I'd probably just fold the river. Anyway, you go ahead and call. Your opponent has quad queens and we get smashed and uh, that's it, we got busted and we, we lost. So I think you can prevent this situation from happening just by checking the turn to begin with. And then if your opponent bets the river, sure you call. Maybe you miss a little bit of value when your opponent has like ace, 10 of spades or pocket jacks, but you have to counter that with like, hey, you prevent yourself from getting stacked the times that your opponent has a queen, pocket tens or pocket seven. So I think that that's, uh, that's you know worthwhile consideration to think about in spots like these. Anyway, this all comes back to your, the way you played this hand preflop. I think if you played this hand differently preflop, you made it like 60, 65, 50, 55, 60, the range of hands that your opponent could have on the river changes because preflop, he's going to be able to have less hands to call an out of position three bet when you make it bigger. Whereas you make it 35, you have no idea what your opponent has. He might have eight, nine, he might have like two unsuited cards, he might have like ace jack because it's such a small bet, you just don't really know what he's doing and it makes this hand hard for you to play on the flop, on the turn, on the river. So you can see how that one little mistake compounds and makes your life very, very difficult in later streets, right? So preflop is the most important time of the game and I built a new preflop product that walks you through exactly how to play situations like these using real hand examples. I have 12 videos in it, I have a guide that teaches you exactly which hands to play from which position. Really awesome content, I encourage you to check that out alexrelly.com slash products. You can see all my best content right there. If you guys have more hands you'd like to send to me, um, subscribe to my channel. I'm uh, definitely like giving first priority to the people that subscribe to review their hands first. So if you guys want your hands reviewed, definitely subscribe to my channel. If you like this content, uh, more coming, out, coming your way. And uh, I'll see you guys next time on the hand of the day. Thanks for watching. Cheers.